1640 and couldn't find it. He wanted to ransack the place apparently like he did so many others, but there we go. No sat nav, no find. Uh, but once you get here, I think you can see how the house kind of grew out the landscape. So we've got three vital ingredients here. First of all, we've got the trees. We have uh, dated the wood in the Great Hall to 1320. So that gives us a date for the start of the house. Uh, we've got lots of water. I know that doesn't look much, that little cataract thing at the back there, but underneath that lawn are huge medieval culverts or drains. So the water, the clean water from springs in the north comes into the uh, moat with two vents at the end, and then it vents into the south lake at the end. So we've got clean water coming in, dirty water going out, so those medieval builders knew what they were doing. Incidentally, the moat has been there from the beginning. They dug the moat out first, put the spoil in the middle, and then the house went on the middle bit. And also while I'm on the moat, um, it's not a defensive thing. It's not going to repel an army, definitely. You can wade across it at its shallowest point with, with a bit of difficulty, but you can. Um, it's simply, look at me, I can afford a moat. <laughs> the people who tended to come here, and we've had quite a few, have all wanted to splash the cash and you know show them how it's done kind of thing and, and make their mark and leave something for posterity. Um, and the final ingredient the house is made of is the Kentish ragstone, which is impervious to water, so a good idea when you've got a moat. So that's why we stay dry um, inside. If not particularly warm, we do stay dry. Um, when I said the house was built in 1320, the only bit of it that was built, <coughs> excuse me, is the bit you can see under the archway and opposite. So that east block with the great hall in it and the entrance where you went in. Uh, so that's all there was. Uh, and in 1320 we had no idea who built it either, which is quite strange because it would have cost an awful lot of money. It's very innovative for its time architecturally. So it's strange we don't have a name. The first name we have is Sir Thomas Corn, who owned the house from 1360 onwards. And the corns were here for the whole of the 13th century. He was a knight from Suffolk. He'd fought with the Black Prince uh, during the Hundred Years' War against the French. And we think the house was partly uh, thank you for services rendered. So the corns were here for all the 1300s. I just press the pause button and say, when people come into this house, they say to you, OK, so who lived here? They're expecting you to say one name, like, oh, the Woodvilles or something like that. But I'm afraid we've had 11 different families, uh, none of them related to each other, um, and as I say, all come in and start wanting to leave their own mark. So you will be pleased to know that I am not speaking about all 11 families, uh, because otherwise we will be here for a long time. I felt a spot of rain be ready to dash. Um, instead, I'm going to pick on those who did things to the house significantly, or those who stayed along. So in 1420, Alice Corn married Richard Hort. Um, he was a very important man. He was attached to the court of Edward III in Westminster, and he was attached to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And um, he was asked quite often if he would uh, entertain guests and take them between this place and that place. So he was the one who soon decided that with his own grand growing family as well, that East Range was not enough. So he's the one who built the other three sides of the moat. And when that wasn't enough, he came out here, built this square and that range of buildings at the back, which over the centuries has been guest accommodation, servants' quarters, stables, stuff like that. Today it houses the very excellent bookshop, second-hand bookshop. The manager has a, a house there, the head gardener, and there's a spare one at the end if you fancy it. That range of stone steps there once led up to a huge hay barn in the 1400s, which is obviously defunct now and disappeared. So that was Richard Hort, I think of him as the builder. In 1520, another Richard came, this time Richard Clement, and I think of him as the decorator. He bought the house in 1520 for £400, and we have a document on the wall in the Great Hall saying that. 
Um, he also was attached to the court in Westminster, but this time we're talking first of all Henry the Seventh and then Henry the Eighth. Now Richard Clement had his head screwed on and he wanted to keep it that way, um, and he decided the best way of doing it was to be a creep. He was part of the Henry's court. He ended up being a, a gentleman usher, which was quite a, a high post, and he had the king's ear. And he could see those around him falling, so he thought, right, I'm going to make sure that if Henry ever comes to this place, that he will be impressed with my loyalty. So he's the one who put up all around the house lots of Tudor badges. Some of you can see that window in the Great Hall. It would be the first room you go in. Have a look at the window. It was there from 1520. It's got Catherine of Aragon's pomegranate, coats of arms of England, the Tudor roses and so on. Do ask the guide about that. And upstairs in the second chapel, the Tudor uh, Protestant chapel with a barrel vaulted ceiling. That ceiling is probably the most important thing in the house. It uh, depicts or it celebrates the marriage of Henry and Catherine of Aragon. So again, ask the guide in there about the symbols. I'm glad to say Henry never came because he would have bankrupted us had he come because he'd have brought his own whole entourage and eaten us out of house and home. I'm also glad to say that Richard Clement uh, retained his position at court, became a sir in 1530, uh, and kept his head as well and his house. So that was good. Yeah. Decorated, you know, decorated yeah. the wrong time. Exactly. We should, of course, um, have whitewashed over all that after Anne Boleyn and the rest came, but oh, we forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been in trouble if Henry had come. Um, so in 1590, the first of the families from the north came, and these were the Selbys from Northumberland. Um, they stayed for 300 years, so they were quite significant. I'm going to pick out just the first two. Um, who did significant things to the house. So William Selby, his ancestor was Richard the Lion, who fought against um, Saladin, the Saracen leader in the Third Crusade. So when you get to one of the things that William Selby did, viz the beautiful Jacobean staircase, which is the staircase you will take to go upstairs, please have a look at the Saracen head at the bottom, because there he is, they put the baddie at the bottom of the, the uh, staircase and I think he's my favourite thing in the house. I think he looks very stern but quite handsome. Um, but it's his wife, Dame Dorothy, who I find even more interesting. She came here in 1620 as a young bride and her husband uh, was indul very indulgent towards her and said you know, she could make any changes that she wanted. And she swiftly decided, and I would be with her on this, that sitting in the Great Hall in the winter was not a pleasant thing, it's freezing cold, far too big to keep warm, so no, she said I'm not having that. I'd like to create one of these newfangled drawing rooms. So her husband said, well, you get on with it, you find a room and you can decorate it yourself, as it were. So she chose a room and she ordered the biggest fireplace she could find in order to be nice and warm. And she chose it from what was called a pattern book which was the nearest thing to an Argos catalogue. Uh, and sadly, she hadn't measured properly because when it came, the builder soon gave her the news she didn't want to hear, which was, um, it's not going to go in, love. I got the same thing when I bought a double bed a few years ago and the, build and the delivery men got halfway up the stairs. I solved it with tea and chocolate biscuits, but they didn't exist in 1620, so she just exerted her personality and said, I want that fireplace to do what you have to do. So the builders, the solution they found, you're in a really good position to see, um, because the drawing room is on the first floor to the left of the tower. And if you look at the roof line, that side of the tower, and compare it to the right side, it's a lot higher, isn't it? Yeah. So there's your solution. You take the roof off and you shove it up a few feet. So and then you get your fireplace in. Um, I'll leave it to you to decide on whether it was worth it. Please do not be seduced by lesser fireplaces, and there are a few of them, on the way to that one. You're looking for the room with the Chinese wallpaper. And look at the far end, okay? We call it the Marmite fireplace. I had to explain to two German visitors last week what Marmite was. Um, anyway, you, you, 
had some. Great, you, you're into bar lights. <laughs> I hate it actually. <laughs> Um, so I think it's great. I love the bottom bit. That's the bit I love. The top bit is crazy. It's kind of part Taj Mahal, part Disney. Um, but I'm sure it was very fashionable at the time. Uh, so see what you make of it. And I'm sure that Dame Dorothy enjoyed sitting in front of it and keeping nice and warm during the winter. So that was her claim to fame, but quite a feisty lady. Uh, the rest of the Selbys who stayed for the 300 years, you'll be glad I am not going to talk about boring lot if you ask me they didn't do anything much they just kept the house ticking over much as it had been so we can speed on to 1890 when a second family from the north came these were the collier fergusons from the borders of scotland they'd made money in railways and stuff like that uh, and they arrived with all the same ideas as everybody else we're going to make everything uh, you know wonderful and show them how it's done there is something about this house that draws people from the north, including moi, who is from Yorkshire. <laughs> anyway, okay, I was flying the flag for Yorkshire when I can. Go and see it, it's beautiful, I'm sure you have. Anyway, so they arrived in 1890, and as I say, Sir Thomas Collier Ferguson started doing stuff straight away. He put in flushing toilets, electricity when it came in, new water pipes and all that sort of thing, underfloor central heating in some places. Um, and he must have, um, uh, he actually